Thank you, Matt. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Hi. Hi. So you might have noticed there's stickers on all the tables. Those are for you. And Matt has a giant bag of maple candies. If you ask a question at the end, you get a maple candy all the way from Canada. <laughs> it is literally just condensed tree sap. Our trees bleed this beautiful, delicious liquid, and we make candy and everything out of it. So yes, I'm trying to bribe you. Um, so I want to talk today about shifting security everywhere. And so I'm, I like to tell people what I'm going to tell them, then I tell them, then at the end I tell you what I told you so that you remember the things. And so we're going to talk about how we need more than just shifting left. What I mean when I say comprehensive security, because I don't see a lot of it, I want to see more. <laughs> um, I want to talk about how we can get developers on board for what we're doing, because we cannot do this without them. And I want to talk about security that works for the business and with the business. So we are helping them make super awesome products that delight the customers that are safe to use. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. So let's go. Um, so. This is me after filming videos for six hours. I get grouchy face. This is resting app sack face. Um, and, and so like sometimes marketing people, and I realize that sometimes I do marketing, but sometimes we can like ruin things um, because pushing security left used to mean something. It used to mean, so shift left. We wanted people to start security earlier. That's what I wanted. When I meant left, I was like earlier in the system development life cycle. Because as a dev, at the very end of every project, like right before we're going to go to prod, the security person would be like, oh, we did a test. You suck. Your deadline's out the window. Fix all this crap. I'm like, why weren't you here nine months ago when I started? I could have, I could have made this part of it. And so we want everyone to shift security more to the beginning, like ideally right at the beginning. Um, but what it turned into with the help of marketing folks is it was like, buy my product. Put in your CICD and all your dreams will come true. And who, who had that happen? No hands? What? No hand? Yeah, okay, what? Two people are like, maybe. Um, and so I realized that I'm at least a little responsible for this because I was super excited about shifting left. And I wrote a talk and I wrote blog articles about it and I went on and on and on. And so I'm sorry. Um, I'm Canadian and we apologize a lot, but I think we could do something better. Um, but first, <laughs> I know it's like, ah, uh, shifting left's not enough. That's like the message I want to get. And instead, I want to talk about how we can have security the whole way through. I want to have security at the beginning, the middle, and then even after you go into production, I still want lots of security. And so that's what we're going to talk about. Um, so comprehensive security. Um, I was talking to a client, and I'm like, what do you do to keep the apps that are in production safe? And he's like, what? <laughs> I'm like, once you release them, he's like, oh, those legacy apps? And he was saying the moment it goes to prod, the next day it's, a, it's considered legacy. And he's like, what's your plan for keeping them secure? He's like, I don't know. I hired you for this. And so we need to have, we need to build them securely and then maintain them to continue to be secure. And we can't do this without the help of all the awesome developers. And I'm going to briefly talk about business buy-in at the end. There's like a little bit of feedback <laughs> happening up here. I don't know if you have these other mics on, but if you could turn them off, that would be awesome. Okay. So, oh, also I took notes for you. So I really like taking notes when I watch a talk, but then sometimes I miss cool stuff. So at the end, there'll be a link and you can go to it and download a summary of every single thing that I said. <laughs> so who, who am I? I'm Tanya Jenka, and I'm the head nerd at WeHack Purple. Um, I wrote a book, and I give secure coding training and all the stuff. Um, I basically, like, I've been being a nerd for, like, a really long time. I'm very good at nerding, and um, I'm on the internet a lot, writing blogs and streaming and doing all that stuff, because that makes me really happy. And so this is me when I've brushed my hair and when I'm wearing glasses. <laughs> um, so I like to have an agenda. And so our agenda today is shifting left, totally not enough. So we did that. And I'm really hoping you agree, because I want to spend the rest of the talk about what we can do that's better than that. So can we take a little vote, like just really quickly? Is shifting left enough on its own hands? Do we need to do more than just shifting left? Okay, this is awesome. Yes. 
Okay, awesome. And so then next, so this is going to be like the biggest part of the presentation, and that's comprehensive security. And I'll explain what I mean by comprehensive. Um, and then we're going to talk about developer buy-in and security that works for the business. And then I'm going to do a conclusion. That's the where I tell you what I told you. And it sounds weird, but we repeat things in a talk specifically because most people need three times to remember it permanently and learn it instead of just memorizing it. And so I'll just repeat the things that I really hope you take home. And then resources. And except the books, all the resources will be free because I like giving stuff away. Um, okay, so what's comprehensive security look like? What's that look like? Um, so I feel it looks like the SDLC is secure. And so we heard a lot of awesome people yesterday talking about how to do that. But also after I release the app, I still want to do a bunch of things to ensure it continues to be secure. And so when I plan things out, this might sound odd, but I prepare and then I start doing the thing and then I also have a plan to continue to maintain the thing. Because security folks, or just maybe human beings, were like, I have this giant plan, I'm gonna do all these things, I bought new running shoes, I'm gonna run all the time, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. And they get ready, and then they go on their first run, they're like, oh my gosh, my hamstrings, oh, when did I get old? And, and so then they don't maintain it. And so I wanna make a plan where it's maintainable. And so I'll kinda of go through each one of these three. Okay, so this is the system development life cycle. If you are, so who here has lived this before as part of their life as a developer or something, like the build software? Okay, so you already breathe this and live this and you know. But whether you're doing Agile or Waterfall or you're doing um, DevOps, you actually still need requirements. You still need to build the thing that you, like design the thing you're going to build, so you need to know what you're doing. You do the coding, that's the super fun part. You do testing and then you release. And so whether you're doing it in little loops or if you're doing an infinity symbol, it doesn't matter, you need these things. And so we can prepare for these things. And so I used to hate documentation because it would be really long and I didn't find it very easy to understand or helpful. And then I started writing documentation and I would make it as short as possible. I'm like, I'm just gonna tell you the eight things I want you to know and I'm gonna tell you on the first page. <laughs> My boss is like, why is this document four pages long? I'm like, because I want someone to read it. And so I like to create documentation for anything that I ask someone else to do at work. So if I expect you to do a secure code review, I'm gonna write a document about it or I'm gonna write a requirement into your project and then I'm gonna show you how to do it. And so for each new project, we could have security requirements if that is a thing that we want to be part of our secure SDLC. We could have a secure design review or do architecture security review or threat modeling. And I have to say this crowd probably really loves threat modeling because I saw three separate talks about it yesterday and all of them were awesome. Um, oh, lights. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> okay. Um, and so if you want people to write secure code, generally, you would create a secure coding standard or guideline of some sort. So I like to create the things that I expect them to do. So I have documentation to show you what I want and I'm more likely to get those things. I guess we're going back to bed. Um, so, so I looked up threat on Unsplash and this was the picture and I was like, yikes. But all the other pictures were like sharks eating people and I felt this was less bad. But I wanted to briefly talk about threat modeling. So I am a big fan of starting small if you're going to threat model because I've seen companies where they're like, we're going to do threat modeling and they have this huge process and they're very excited and they do one iteration and everyone's exhausted and the rest of the apps never get any threat modeling done and I'd rather do a little bit on all of them instead of a lot on only one. And so I try to just start with a one hour meeting and I ask Adam's questions. Uh, for those of you who might not know, Adam Shostak was here yesterday and he gave some training and I follow a lot of the stuff that he does because I find he simplifies things for me. Um, and so if you're gonna do something like threat modeling, you need to have the capacity to do it. And you might be like, oh, well, no, of course, but I worked with a company and I made them a secure designing or a secure code guideline and then we did this big workshop this whole afternoon about here's our guideline, eventually it's going to be a standard, we're going to do this and I get to the slide about all your secrets are going to go in this awesome secret management tool from now on and this and this and this and one of the devs put up their hand and they're like, 
Oh yeah, security never bought that for us. They've been talking about it for two years. And so are you making a policy where we're, we have to put our secrets into a secret tool, but we're not allowed a secret tool? Because we wanted to buy one ourselves, and they said, no, we're going to do it. And I was like, oh my God. So it's really important that you like follow up on the things you ask them to do and make sure you're doing your part. Because the security team's like, oh yeah, the project kind of got put off the wayside, like slipped off the table. I'm like, so you want to make a rule that all their secrets have to go in a secret store. They're not allowed buying one because you're going to do it and you just didn't do it. Guys, come on. So that's important, in my opinion. Um, so I try to set a paradigm or like a plan for how to review design and architecture. And I am a fan. Okay, so I'm not a fan of this. I worked somewhere once and the security guy made a two-page questionnaire. The architecture guy made an 80-page questionnaire. Guess who actually got their questionnaire answered? Us on the security team. I'm like, no one's going to fill out your 80-page template, buddy. He's like, they have to or they won't go to prod. I'm like, you know they can all go to prod whenever they want, right? Devs can do anything they want. They're all little hackers, just no one told them yet. They're like, I found a workaround. I'm like, you made an exploit, buddy. <laughs> but it's true. And so... I like to have a whiteboard or paper, or whatever, and just like draw out and ask questions and draw. And I'm like, oh, cool, you have this and this. How do those two talk? Is that encrypted when they talk? Do you do authentication authorization? How does that work? And you just ask questions and be curious. And then eventually you're like, I need three changes, please. And you take a picture and you put it into the, the folder for your project. You're like, I just documented stuff. It doesn't have to be really hard and really complex every time. If you start smaller, you'll do better. Um, I also am a fan of giving developers security tools because there's way more of them than us. Um, in January of last year, GitHub released, so I, I have a lot of trust in GitHub when it comes to their statements about developers, and they said there's now 500 software developers for every InfoSec professional. We are grossly outnumbered, so we need their help. So I like to, I, I don't know if you want to use SAST or DAS or SCA, a linter tool, it doesn't matter. Give them something to work with so they can do some of the security work for you because we can't do it all ourselves. And so this is part of the way I like to try to prepare for it. So I get a tool, I make sure that they're willing to use it, I train them how to use it so they feel confident and awesome, I buy the licenses. Um, another thing is be nice to the project manager team. So I like to consider the project manager my friends. They don't always know it yet, but we're going to be besties by the end of the project. <laughs> and I tell them like, hey, we're going to do like this engagement with a pen tester and we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And so I need it to be in the project schedule. Friends don't not tell friends about a giant thing that's going to be part of their project and make it really late. So be friendly and be an ally to the project team by actually telling them what you want in advance. Um, if you work somewhere and they have a CICD or a pipeline or whatever you want to call that, because everyone calls it something different, figure out what can go in there safely and with the consent of the DevOps folks, and then figure out what will go outside and what will be maybe automated overnight. Right. So everything does not need to go in there if someone tells you that. They might not have a lot of developer friends because that's what I did with the OWASP dev slot project. I put nine tools in. I'm like, I'm amazing. It was not amazing. <laughs> it was like, why is this pipeline running for three hours, Tanya? I'm like, I don't know. So be, um, be, be, be fair. Um, so a thing I really like to do. So, um, when I was a dev, there, so all the security people that I had dealt with would just say no to me all the time. And they would just tell me like, well, you should have known better. You should do this. And they would never help me. They would just tell me that I was wrong and I was not awesome. And then one day we had this project kickoff meeting and this woman named Alicia walked in. And um, I ended up getting to work with her a bunch of times. And I'm still her biggest fan or at least one of her biggest fans. And she's like, hi, I'm Alicia and I'm your security human. I'm going to be with you for this whole project. If you need a pen tester, I'm going to get it. You need a review, I'm going to do it. If you have a question, I'm going to find it. And she was so great. And so if you can show up at the, the kickoff meeting, I have this friend named Nicole Becker, and she's an OWASP, or she was an OWASP chapter leader for a long time and project leader. And she's like, hi, I'm Nicole. I'm from security. I come in peace. And it works. <laughs> it works. Being friendly and cute and funny works because they're used to 
having people be mean to them at a lot of companies. And so um, ideally, you get all of the stuff that you expect to do into the project schedule. I have been on so many projects where it, things went very badly because the security team's like, oh yeah, by the way, we did a pen, like we're going to do a pen test and we're going to need you to like do this and do this and do that. And then they give you the results and they have to fix all those things. And it's like, why aren't our projects ever on time? I'm like, well, because you keep adding stuff last minute. So we want to avoid that if we can. There we go. Um, so if you want an external contractor to come in, if you could do that terrible thing called procurement to make it happen, um, if you want to set up tests in the CICD, so if you can, as you're executing your plan, do these things. Like you plan for them, you start doing them. I know that sounds really obvious, but it's not always. Um, so this is the hardest one of all the advice or action items that I will give you during this talk is to make time to talk to the developers if they need you. This is the hardest part. Like if you have time to check in with them and see how they're doing, and this, this might sound nuts, but I remember I was doing AppSec, this big governmental organization, and we had almost 2,000 developers. And I was the only security person that knew how to code. And I would get so many emails. I'd be in meetings and I'd just see them going off my screen. They're just like scrolling down because new ones are coming. And so they started writing me on LinkedIn. They started writing me on Twitter. They're like, I just need you to review my design, okay? Because we didn't have enough support for them. And so I know this, this is hard. It's like when people say, oh, well, why don't you just patch? You know, if it was easy, they would do it, right? It's not like there's a button and they're like, nah, I don't want to press it. Let's wait till next week. That's not what's happening. It's really hard. And so if you can make time, it's good. Um, Okay, so another thing that can help us maintain a secure system development lifecycle is a security champions program. Um, I talk about this a lot. I have many blog posts and a conference talk and all sorts of things where I obsess over champions. Um, and I've consulted with 40 different companies helping them build champion programs because I'm really excited about it. These people will help make sure the things that you want to happen actually happen and are actually a success. And we're going to come back to these champions in a little minute, but they can help create your secure SDLC and they can help maintain your secure, your legacy apps to be secure. Okay, one more. You might need policies, you might need resources, but you will definitely need support of upper management. If you talk to a really nice dev that's down the street for, or down the hall from you, and they're like, hey, I'll fix this thing, this sounds great, but their boss is like, no, you will build this feature, guess what they're going to do? They're going to build the feature, right? Because that's their boss. And that person decides if they get to keep working there. Um, so it's really important we have upper management involved, and this is the thing that will make sure you maintain your systems that you set up. This is the hard part. It's easy to plan. It's easy to start. It's continuing like two, three years later, continuing to do all the stuff you're supposed to do. Ask anyone that has a podcast, your first two or three episodes, so easy. Episode 50, oh my God, so hard. It's true. Um, and so this is the second part now. So we talked about creating a secure system development lifecycle. And we've talked about that all day yesterday as well. Like there are many talks about that. So I feel like a lot of you already know a lot about that, but I want to talk about shifting right. And so I, I live in British Columbia, and our trees are gigantic. That wasn't even the biggest tree I saw that day. And I'm not really lifting it. That's a trick of the eye, but I thought it looked really cute. <laughs> um, so Because it's hard. It's really hard to secure all the legacy apps. A, a few years ago, I worked with an app that was 38 years old. I'm like, this app could have had a baby app, and that baby app could vote. <laughs> That's an old app. <laughs> and so how do we keep things like that safe? And so I want to do the, the thing, oh, wait, wait, back. I want to do the thing where we talk about planning it, and then we start doing it, and then we maintain it. So I'm going to go through that process again, because it works in my brain where I'm like, I get ready for everything, I start doing it, and I'm like, how do I make sure I keep doing it? So the first thing I like to do is take inventory. So like I've worked at a lot of places now, and the first thing I do, I'm like, do you have a list of all your apps? And they're always like, we have a list. Certainly not all of our apps. I'm like, how can we do inventory? How can we know what we're protecting? How can I know everything's had a test if I don't even know what we have? And um, I'm very, very, very excited to tell you that last year, a couple of startups came out with products that actually will do automated web asset inventory for you. I'm not going to recommend any of them specifically, like by name, but there used to be zero. Then there were some that would like, well, we could find 
your infrastructure. I'm like, I already know where my infrastructure is. And then they could find like the, on your domain, they would like scrape stuff. I'm like, cool. But now they have ones that will actually go through your data center and on-prem and find them for you and be like, you see this API? That API is very sad. It's important. And so then I have this list of apps. I'm excited. I think things are going to happen. And then I call it taking their temperature. But basically, I, whatever tool that we have on hand when I get there, I'm like, let's scan all of them. I want to see if this app lights up like a Christmas tree when I look at the results. There's just like red and orange and yellow. Or is it like looking okay? Because there will be, so basically the older the app is, the more scary it usually is. That's not always true, but quite often. And so if you work at a place where uh, they have lots of old apps, you're going to get very exciting results from your tool. And then you can kind of say, we have to look at these first. We can look at these second. These ones are actually okay. I'm not embarrassed. It's good. Um, so this includes APIs, serverless, like anything that's exposed to the internet, especially, really, really want to keep track of them. Um, so I am a fan of purchasing the tools that you need and then training everyone how to use it so that then they feel confident. So I don't know if you've ever worked somewhere where they're like, okay, we use this now, and then you get no training on it, and you're trying to use it, and the first couple of weeks you feel like a moron every day. I've had this happen where I'm just like, why won't it do anything? And it's like, I had no training. And so if you can provide training for them, the thing you want them to do will go better. And it sounds odd, but People, if, if they feel dumb, cause they're using, like, if they're using your product and they feel dumb, they don't want to use your product anymore. And I know this cause I did developer relations for a while. And if the product just makes the users feel stupid, they're like, I hate that product. And so if you can train them and make them feel like I am a Jedi, I can control this product with my mind, then they'll like it more and you will get more of what you want. Okay, um, I also am a big fan of talking to the incident response team. Has anyone here ever done incident response? Okay, yeah. Software incidents are kind of different than like malware or ransomware or some of the other incidents that happen really quite often, unfortunately. But if like one of your custom apps is being attacked, Sometimes you don't even know what's going on. <laughs> or sometimes the developers will say to me, yeah, this app, it like falls down all the time and the global exception handler is constantly being called, but we don't know what's going on. I'm like, I know what's going on, something nefarious. And so I try to meet with those teams and tell them when to call me. I worked somewhere once and the incident response team's like, hey, so like, you think we're having a security incident with this app? And I'm like, cool. When did it start? So like last month, and I'm like, why are you telling me now? And they just didn't realize that I could help. And so if you can introduce yourself to these people and make yourself available, and if you can show software developers how to spot, like, that's wonky. We should call, we should call AppSec and tell them about it. I'd rather have like 10 false alarms than one real incident that I don't find out about until Vice Magazine asks me for a quote about it. It's bad. Um, so I like to, so I've heard so many people, vendors, talk about continuous scanning, but I have to say, I still think it's good. I like to try to scan things regularly. Like you get out into prod, I still want to have my eyes on you. So, but I don't, a lot of people are like, we must scan in prod or it's not exactly accurate. I'm like, well, if you're going to do a pen test, that could apply. Or if you're going to do red teaming, that could apply. But if I'm just like pew pew with a dast, as long as it's, it mirrors what's in prod, I don't need it to be in prod. I don't need it to have real data. I could, every time you check in your code or you make a pull request, we could scan it with a static analysis tool or software composition analysis tool, and we could get results, right? Like, you don't have to do everything in prod, but I really like to set up automated tests, and if so, I like to suck up all those results into a tool like maybe Defect Dojo, um, and, and then I can see what's going on with everything, and I can show management. And so I guess the message is scanning, more scanning. Oh my gosh, so much scanning. <laughs> I like more is more when it comes to knowing what's going on with your app. So like if you can scan them every month and see patterns and see if things are going up or down, it's really helpful. Um, so this one says set up logging, but not that type of logging. That's all the pictures that came up when I looked up logging. But I see a lot of applications that don't have that much logs. I was investigating something because uh, one of my clients, they're like, oh, Visa called us and 28 of like credit cards that we processed all got snipped, so they want us to tell them what happened. And I'm like, okay, cool. They had no logs. 
They had nothing. It took us three weeks to figure out how to prove that it wasn't us, and it turned out it was a convenience store that was in the building of all these people that happened to be our customer, um, and it, it worked out, and it wasn't us. It was forever to figure out and prove it without logs. And so even my APIs, if I can get them to log, I would like that. That would make me happy. Okay, so the champions are back. Um, I like to talk to the champions once a month, one-on-one. -on -one. And that may sound like a lot of work, and it is. Champions programs can be a lot of work. But when I did it, I had five teams, or was it six? I think it was five teams. And then eventually, yeah, and then eventually it was the sixth team. And so it, that's really six meetings a month. I can do that. It's not as scary anymore. And then I would also talk to them and ask them, hey, what's going on? What are you working on? Do you need help? What's going on? And I just check in. And at first they're like, nothing, everything's fine. But after a few months, they're like, so there's this thing, Tanya, I'm kind of concerned. And slowly you build more and more trust, and then eventually they truly are your champion. So at first they're just a developer that's like humoring me. But then eventually they're like, hey, check out this cool bug I found. I'm like, yes! Okay, um, so a thing that I, I taught, like, I have to bargain with clients all the time. They're like, we want to make the service level agreement. They're going to fix criticals like on day one. They're going to fix, you know, highs in like five business days and blah, blah, blah. I was like, no one's fixing literally anything at your company right now. If you make a service level agreement that says that, they'll all just laugh at you and it will go in the trash. Instead, let's start very gentle, like super gentle. And then in six months, everyone's doing it. Then let's go bigger. And then maybe another year, bigger and bigger until you're actually on track. But quite often, like we see, um, so Chris Romeo talked about this in his talk yesterday. We were like, but Netflix does this. I'm not Netflix. We're not Netflix. Most of my, all my companies except one that I've ever worked with are not Netflix, as it turns out. Um, and so they're, they're just like, we need to do this. We need to, and like, it's nice you saw an amazing human being at a conference say that. But what we're trying to do is clean up a giant sloppy mess right now. We want to get to like not embarrassing and then work towards respectable. And then maybe one day we could shoot for the stars, but like, let's just make it so we're proud of what we have with our apps. Um, and so if we can help developers become compliant, this helps too. And whenever I've done a, this might sound odd, but the first time I did a secure coding guideline, and then we're going to make it a standard right away, which I've learned doesn't always go well, I had this meeting with some devs to show it to them, and I was like, oh, I'd really like your feedback. And one of them was really quiet, and he kept looking at the table, and I'm like, do you have feedback? He's like, are you going to fire me? I'm like, what? He's like, our apps are really old, Tanya. They're so old. They're so crappy. I saw a scan. It was terrible. Are we all going to get fired? I'm like, no, no one's fired. Don't leave us. <laughs> and so you might have to like explain this isn't a stick I intend to hit you with. This is a thing I want us to achieve together. And that might sound silly, but it's true. Um, so I'm a big fan of a lot of the OWASP projects, and this is an OWASP project I really like, and because I'm on OWASP conference, I'm allowed talking about how I love OWASP. And so um, Matt, who introduced me, is one of the people that created Defect Dojo, and it's so awesome. It'll suck up all the results from all your amazing scanning, scanning, and more scanning, and show you trends, and show you potential problems. Like I was working with a client once, I'm just like checking, oh, I'm totally doing okay on time, go Tanya. Usually I'm like talking too much. Um, but basically we scanned all the results, and we we're looking at and looking at, and the guy, like the full-time AppSec dude was like, I don't see any patterns. And then we clicked on the technology button, and it turned out, so they had six PHP apps, and then a whole bunch of like .NET, Java, everything under the sun, 70% of all their vulnerabilities were in those six PHP apps. <laughs> like, yes, metrics to the rescue. And so we did secure coding in PHP immediately, right? And so if you can see patterns, um, you can, you could just do a better job. Um, I have like this talk all about data. I really love using metrics to kind of move, because when I first started doing AppSec, I'm like, let's do the thing that I saw in the talk. And sometimes those things work and sometimes they don't work. And if you don't measure, you can't tell how good or how well you are doing at your plan. And so I'm a big fan of measuring. Okay, so now we want to maintain our legacy apps as secure. So we've got ready for it, and now we're going to start doing it. And so this is a big slide with lots of stuff, but like I said, you can just download the notes later. But basically, I want to try to continue to support all my wonderful software developers and my champions with like lunch and learns, or it, like a presentation like this, 
If you were terrified of presenting like I was when I started, I, I kid you not, I was like, can you die of public speaking? <laughs> I was informed that's, that's not true. You cannot die of public speaking. <laughs> but when I went to go speak to my dev teams, they're my peers. Like, I really respect them. I'd been on the dev team, and I moved to the security team, and I'm like, I really want them to still think I'm smart. And they're very nice to me. And so you can do this, too. It's not as scary. It's not as bad as you might think. And if you just get up and you're like, hi, okay, so this month we found this bug like six times, and so I wanted to talk about this bug and how we could squash it forever together. So try to talk to them regularly. Um, I, I try, so I realize I give training, so I'm very biased that I think people need training, but once a year, if you can refresh them, and it sounds odd, but I'll have companies call me, I'm like, oh, I trained you last year, you should get a different person to train you this year because you already know what I think. Um, like taught like an intense training once a year and then little tiny bits of information all throughout the year, especially if you see a problem. Um, I like to ask for feedback and the feedback's not always great. I try to remind them I have feelings, <laughs> but if you ask for feedback, sometimes they'll say things that are very, things you had no idea. So I was working with a client two years ago and I, like, I'd met with the devs a bunch of times, and so we're having this meeting, and I was like, can I have some feedback? And they're like, <clears throat> well, what if the feedback was about a different person on your team? And I was like, sure. And they're like, so two of your guys implemented, and I'm not going to say the name of the tool, and they're like, now our local host won't run. And I was like, what? And they're like, yeah, we can't compile and run. We have to push to dev, which means we have to go in the CI CD, which means we have to go to the meeting that happens every two weeks with the change management. And so basically I'm making changes and I can't tell if it's the right color or if the font size is. We can't start our apps and look at them. And I was like, this is not acceptable. And so then I went and talked to the other two guys and they're like, oh, they told us like, what, what's local host? And I'm like, it's only the thing I need to use 37 times per day so I can see, oh, I changed it a little bit. Let's run it again. And you just, you make your app run on the local host, a little fakey web server. And then you can see what it looks like and click the buttons. It's like, no, it's still not right. Going to fix this bug some more. And you do that over and over again all day. And they didn't know because they weren't devs. And I was like, this literally is disabling the entire team. They can't do almost anything. It's taking forever because of this. And so they undeployed it, like uninstalled it from everywhere, got some professional services, and then redeployed it, and then it worked. And feedback. Feed, like, could you imagine how many of their projects would fail if they can't actually see if their app's doing the things they think it does? Um, I try to speak every year at the all staff for as short amount of time as possible. Um, who here has been at an all staff that's really, really boring and you're like, I would rather do literally anything else than be here? Yeah. So I, one, I try to like bring carbs. So if you can like bring donuts or bagels or cookies or pizza, <laughs> everyone will like you better. <laughs> um, and if you can speak for a short period of time, that helps too. But like literally five minutes, like, hi, I'm Tanya. Remember me? I want to remind you about this and this and tell you this cool thing that this person did. Cool. I'm out. If you ever need security stuff, you call us. And that might sound silly, but then you'll get all these calls. It's like, oh, I saw something or this is weird because they remembered you're there. Um, I also think we should... So if you don't have an inventory tool, you don't have to do inventory every year, but if you have an automated tool you're paying for every year, at least scan. I have a bunch of pen tester friends and they tell me maybe once per year, I'm like testing an API and it's like version two point whatever. It's like, let's see if version one's still up. And once a year they find one. And guess what that version one is? Still connected to the production database, totally super duper insecure, still internet connected. So if you run these scans, you can say like, oh my gosh, that's not supposed to be there and you can take it offline. Uh, I really like to, so if you have security incidents, I like to perform a post-mortem. It doesn't have to be a huge thing, but basically like, what happened? What could have gone better? What went really well? Can we avoid this in the future? And so I actually got permission to do my first AppSec program because I was like, it's been four months. Let's, let's look at all this stuff. And I shoved it all into Excel. It's like, wow, 26% of our incidents were all AppSec incidents. And then I was like, oh, 75% of the cost and time were the AppSec incidents. And so I presented that to them. And I was like, I think I could fix these if we did this and this. 
And they're like, how much does that cost? And it was way less than the security incidents. And they're like, approved. And so you can use this information to help change things for the better. But if you don't look at the information or you don't gather the information, then you can't use it. So like I said, obsessed with data. OK. Um, I, I talked about service level agreements. You might want to follow up with certain apps that are scary, like the app that was old enough that it could have had a baby app and the baby app could vote. Like apps like that need special attention. Sometimes you need to help them make them become more secure or get enough money and, and support to do a rewrite or a complete refactor. So this is a place where you can make a lot of developer friends if you help advocate for them in this. And so checking in on those are really good. And so this was like the hardest, biggest part of the presentation. And we're going to get a little bit more fun with the developer buy-in. I really like software developers because I have been one since I was like 16. And all my aunts are software developers. And most of my uncles are software developers. And most of my cousins are software developers. <laughs> and so when I was, like, was 18, I'm like, I think I want to take computer science in college. They're like, yes, we know. What else would you do? <laughs> right? It's like people where they're like, my dad was a cop, my dad's dad was a cop, and it's like, where are you going to be? I'm like, I'm going to be a cop, except for nerdier. Um, so I want to talk about how we can be nice to devs and get them to help us. So we are hopefully helping them. Like, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to help them make tougher, safer apps. And so how can we get them on board? And so I have a, a lot of notes here, so I'm going to stand. I don't like podiums. I'd rather walk around and move my arms a lot. I've been told that I can't really talk unless I move my arms. <laughs> OK, so training. So I am a fan of training, like a big training thing maybe once a year, but you can't do that all the time. Devs have work to do. You can't just be like, oh, we're just going to take them for a week. It's actually really, really expensive. I used to use this site where it, you would like calculate how much a meeting cost. So I'd be like, these people, they get paid this much, and it was one hour. And I'd be like, this meeting was $3,000. Did we need to have it? Because a meeting can sometimes be an email. Um, so I'm a big fan of champions, like I said. So champions are awesome for us because they help us. But it's actually awesome for them because they get to learn cool new experiences they get to have more stuff on their resume. They might one day join the security team. Those are like the absolute best people to recruit to your team. Um, and on top of that, like they build better, safer, more amazing applications. And so um, I ask them for feedback all the time. And it sounds weird, but I'll ask myself, what can I do to feed into their desire to make really amazing software? Because they have like... So I don't know about you, but they have a lot of pride in the work they do. They're like, I made this. It's beautiful. Want to see? Like, that's how I was. I was like, I would like show my mom. I'd be like, mom, look what I made. And I'm an adult. <laughs> and so like, if you can feed into like that, not ego, but like pride, like they're so excited about what they do. And if you can help feed into it that like when your app's really secure, it's an even better, more amazing piece of software that you've made. You can get more of literally everything you want from them because you're on board with what they are on board with. And so every month I try to talk to the champions and I've heard of companies where they're like, oh, it's really hard. I'm like it is, but it's so worth it because they'll start telling you so many secrets. They'll tell you about workarounds that their teammate made. And then you're like, they rolled their own crypto. Oh my God. I've seen that twice now, like recently. I'm like, why? That's not, no. Um, so ideally, I like to share. I want to share as much information as I can. I joke that I try to communicate like so much, but just before they find you annoying. So like telling them what's coming. So next month we're doing a project and it's on this. If anyone wants to participate, let me know. And then the next month it's like, hey, we're starting this project in case anyone. And then by the time the thing happens, everyone already knows. Everyone's already seen it. They're like, yes, we know you're rolling the tool out. And we know, we know. But then no one objects because they've known and they've been part of the process. Um, and so I try, oh, this is the, oh, wait, wait, back one. I try to help them with whatever I can. So I have this friend named Ray and he writes this blog called Hella Secure. <laughs> yeah. Um, and he, he talks about like, you know, you're my customer. Um, I serve you. That's what I do for devs. And he, he talks about like, um, helping them with everything. And so he's like, yeah, I'll just help them architect their whole app because I was a software architect long before I was an AppSec person. So they just know like 
I'll just come to their sessions and I just help them because it's my job to serve them. And even if I'm not technically doing security work, what I'm doing is I am buying a favor for later. Where I'm like, you know how that bug is really bothering me and I know you said I had a tight deadline, but maybe you could help me. And because you helped them, they're more likely to say yes. And then recognizing. So this is a one that's weird. So I really like calling out people and telling them when they did a good job. I'm a big fan of like telling my staff like, you know, you're awesome, right? Let me tell you how awesome you are. That's how I am. But not all managers are like that. If you recognize them, and I don't mean be like, hey, you're Joe, right? That's not what I mean. I mean, you write Joe's boss and say, uh, did you know that Joe did this awesome thing? Yeah, he's pretty great. Um, put something in their performance review. We could never have done this without this person. This person helped with this security incident, and it would not have been resolved in nearly as fast without this person's assistance. And so when you do those things, you help them like, go in their career, get a raise, etc., but then they're like, oh, they really appreciate me. And it sounds weird, but they're doing this whole extra job on top of their regular job for no extra money. If they feel unappreciated, it's not going to go very well for them. Okay, so one more of the big wordy slides. So communicate. So I already said this. But if we want to maintain the buy-in, we have to continue to talk to the devs. And sometimes it can just be, hey, so I live in Canada. And we have every religion in the whole world in our country. We have a mix of everyone in, in every office, which is awesome. But that means in December, there are so many religious holidays, you cannot hold a meeting. And so we'll be like, oh, should we do a presentation? No, we shouldn't, because almost it. no matter what we do, there's going to be this big group of people that can't go. So instead, we'll send an email and be like, this is a video we like, this is a podcast episode we thought you might like, and this is a blog we saw, and we wish you all happy holidays. And in January, we're going to do blah, blah, blah. Like, you don't have to have some big formal thing, but you have to make sure they know you're still there. Measure. This is a big thing. So, um, so there's two parts of this. So one is you want to measure how your AppSec program is doing and how your Security Champions program is doing so you can report to management and all these things. But it's also so you can make sure you can do better in the future. If you're not measuring, it can be really hard to prove return on investment. A lot of security teams never prove return on investment, but when I showed them, like, listen, we had this many security incidents, it costs this much and this much time, and I could do this for this amount, and it was a much smaller number, they were like, yeah, like, on the spot, approved, boom. And it was great, and you can do that too, but you have to have the numbers. Okay, and then the last thing, which is the hardest part of any program is not stopping. So a lot of companies I'll work with, they're like, we had a security champions program and we had three presentations the first month and we had two the next month and the following month we were really tired and the month after that we had one and then we, that was years ago. <laughs> and it's like, how do you pick that back up? And so um, no matter what it is, even if you just, so I know we're in COVID right now, so are we, depends on your country, how you feel about that. So maybe you're not going into an office anymore, but you can just ping people on whatever chat thing that you use and say like, hey, we haven't talked in a while. I just wanted to know what's up and if you need any help. And that can lead to a conversation. And then eventually you can pick your program back up again. So please don't feel bad if you've kind of dropped things for a few months. You, you can always pick it back up. It's just harder the longer you leave it. Okay, and so then the last section. This is security that works for the business. So this is important. Who here has worked somewhere where the security team made a policy and it made your life very bad? <laughs> oh, really? So few hands. Okay, I want to work where you work. <laughs> that sounds great. I used to work for the government in Canada and it was like, are you trying to make it so I can never get my job done? Is that literally your whole purpose in life? <laughs> And so, so when I started doing security, I'm like, I, I like, especially because I'd switched from the dev team to the security team, I'd be like, oh no, we can't do that. They have a deadline. I remember my team being like, are you on our side or theirs? I'm like, I think I'm on theirs. Okay, so security that works for the business too. So we want to prepare and then we want to start doing it and then we want to maintain, continue to be nice to the business folks. 
Um, so one of my friends made this for me, except for instead of the security team, instead of famous rich man's name. Um, but I thought this was more appropriate. So this type of attitude, this, this does not work. <laughs> like, we're the big bad security team, and we're going to say no. It really doesn't work at all. Even if you're Tanya, it doesn't work at all. And so instead, we want to plan things that the business, like that works for them. And you're, you're, I'm going to repeat a lot of stuff I said from the devs. We want feedback. I ask for feedback all the time. I ask for feedback like when I'm teaching, I ask for feedback when I'm like consulting, I ask for feedback from my staff for me. Like we have these 360 reviews. I'm like, how am I doing? Am I making enough time for you? Am I being a ridiculously annoying bottleneck? Am I like, you know, making you work too many hours? Am I giving you too much work? Am I giving you not enough work? And it sounds weird, but then everything goes better. Right? And so we want to ask the business folks. We want to ask them what scares them. When I first started doing threat modeling, I just got to sit in and watch someone else who's super amazing. Um, and he would just like turn to them. He's like, what keeps you up at night? And it, he would just do it so casually. And then they would just be like, I'm really worried about blah. Um, and I remember I was like working at Elections Canada and they're like, we're really worried about voter suppression. We want every Canadian to have the, who has the right to vote to be able to vote. We want it to be as easy as possible, and we want them to never feel intimidated or discouraged in any way. That keeps me up at night. And so then we changed a lot of the things we were doing to focus on the things that mattered to them. And we had a really good turnout, and that was awesome. And so when you talk to them and you listen, you can do better stuff together. Um, I like to look through the policies when I start working at places, like if I'm full-time, because a lot of them suck. <laughs> like at the time when they made them, it seemed like a good idea, but then you're using them and it's not going well. And so I'm like, is there a way we can make it so there's not 23 steps every time we run a scan? What if we automated this? What if we didn't have to have 37 approvals? Like there's got to be a better thing we can do. And so when you fix those, you make everyone happier. Um, yeah, and I, I ask them, is there stuff my team's doing that we could do in a different way that would make your life better? And they look at me like, is this a trap? It's not a trap. <laughs> I mean it. And sometimes I can fix it and sometimes I can't. Like I remember this, this executive, he's like the CEO of the company and he's like, I don't like web filtering. I want to go see whatever website I want. Turn that off. And I was like, uh, no, sir. <laughs> nope. I'm like, but what I can do is I can put my team, like I make a special email that goes like high priority. So every time you click that button, it goes straight to us. And within one hour during the business day and within eight hours, not during business hours, we will get it looked at and approved or blocked if it's dangerous. And he's like, oh, wow, your predecessor just said no. You actually like offered a solution. I was not expecting that. He's like, God, I thought he was going to fire me. <laughs> and he didn't. And that was great. And the last one's listen. Like, listen, listen, listen. You know that saying, we have two ears and one mouth? Whatever you think of that silly saying, it's true that the more we listen, the more we can learn about what they really need. And like, if you ask and then listen, and I mean, if you could take notes, that's even better. And then ask again in six months, has this improved? How are we doing? And I know it's scary to ask for feedback, especially if you're just starting a program or you're just doing something you're like, it's not perfect yet. Yeah, but it's okay. It's okay if it's not perfect. Yeah, get up. Security needs more changes. No. Um, yeah. <laughs> so how can we execute this? Um, so we can invite product owners and software developers to our threat modeling sessions. I remember like the first one I did, they're like, you're going to do what to my app? And I was like, well, no, I'm not going to, but it's possible that malicious actors could do that. And so we need to prepare. And they're just like, why is the internet so scary? But the more you talk to them, the more you can make better software and better threat models. Because um, not all models are great, but if you can help people with the models, life is good. Um, so I do consulting, and consulting means reporting up all the time to remind them why they pay you. It's like, please don't fire me. Please renew that contract. Yeah, look at the metrics. That's helpful. But also, if you could give them access to a dashboard so they can look whenever they want to, they probably won't look that often. But the second part is, is tell the story of the metrics. So I used to work at Microsoft, and we would track everything, and I remember we, we would write blogs to like try to help people do things themselves so they wouldn't have to call help desk. So I'm like, I'm going to show you how to configure all these cool security things. And then my one colleague, he would get a zillion clicks. 
he'd get like 5,000 and I'd get like 400. I'm like, how do you do that? And he's like, I go on Reddit. I'm like, oh, Reddit's terrible. <laughs> so scary. <laughs> They're really mean to me there. And he's like, oh, I get lots of clicks. And then, and then we measured how long people were staying. And on average, people were staying 1.5 minutes on my blog posts and 1.5 seconds, which is just too long to be called a bounce on his. And so it turned out almost no one was reading his. They were just clicking. And I don't understand. And I noticed that with Reddit too. Like, I don't get very many reads. Like, I don't care if someone clicks a hundred times. I want to know if my blog post helped someone. And if someone spends a minute and a half on it, they're probably reading it. Yes. And so tell the story of the data. Interpret it for them. Oh, we have 50 more bugs this month than last month. Yeah, because we hired this awesome hotshot pen tester and he found a zillion things that our automated tools couldn't find. They were always there. We just, now we can find them and we can fix them now because this awesome new person we hired. So make sure you explain because it can be scary otherwise. I like this photo. She's just like, oh no. <laughs> um, so tell them when a security project is coming. Ask for feedback on every new policy. Like over communicate. And I know I said that four times, but it's okay. Um, this is a weird thing. So when people break a policy, there's a reason. And it's almost never that they're like, forget you, I'm going to do bad stuff. That's very rare. Usually when people break a policy, it's because I needed to get my job done and you put barriers in the way. So I did what I had to do to do my job. And I have seen all sorts of things. Like there is a government department where they are uploading really sensitive documents to the internet to turn them into PDFs because the other team was like, we don't want to let them print to PDF because we think they'll just do stupid things. And so we said no. And, and the license was expensive. And I'm like, oh, so we're just giving our secret documents away then? Awesome. And so they broke the policy because they had to get their job done. And I was like, great, I am implementing this like tomorrow. <laughs> oh. So ask, like, so figure out why and then try to fix the problem. Okay, so I have, wait a minute. I have one more slide on this. Okay. I like to, so I remember the first time I did this, my boss is like, what are you doing? Don't show the developers the new secure coding guideline. You just tell them this is what it is. And I'm like, yeah, but they're, they're smarter than me. It's like a hundred of them. <laughs> if I could get a bunch of them to look at it, think of how smart we could be together. And so I held, so then she went on vacation and I held five consultations behind her back. <laughs> Because that's the type of employee I am. And we improved and improved and improved it. And um, I, I, I call this the Mulrooney maneuver. And so in Canada, we used to uh, present the budget and every single department would be angry. <laughs> and so this guy named M Brian Mulrooney, who eventually became our prime minister, he was in charge. He was the finance minister and he's doing the budget. And he went and he talked to everyone. And he's like, hey, I'm like thinking this. And they're like, oh, no, we need more of that and less of this and blah, blah, blah. And so he actually talked to all 200 departments. And so when he presented his budget, everyone already knew what it was. And they're like, go Brian. And so just ask everyone first and get feedback and feedback and feedback and do as much as I can because you can't please everyone all the time. But you don't need to piss off everyone all the time. <laughs> right? So it's like the middle part there. Okay. And so now, wait, wait. Yeah. Okay, so we've talked about doing some security for the business. We've talked about how we want developer buy-in. We talked about securing stuff during the system development lifecycle, but also after we release it. So like shifting security right as well, the legacy stuff. And now we're going to do a conclusion. Oh, I think I'm just going to say what I just said. Um, yeah, so shifting left is not enough. We want to, so comprehensive means complete and very thorough. And that's what we want. And you can start small and you can get better and better. But if you're only securing apps during the system development lifecycle, and then you push them out into the world and you never look at them again, it's not in like two years from now, you're going to start having a very bad life. Um, we need developers to buy into this or it's not going to go well. We want to talk to this business and make sure things work well for them. Um, and so this is why I called it shifting security everywhere. I don't want to just have it left. I don't want to have it just right. I want us to like have security in all the things by communicating a lot, which I know sounds a lot easier because I'm an extrovert and not all of us are extroverts, but it will get less painful. And so, wait, wait, there we go. So we can actually do this. The people in this room can do this. You can. You might not do all of this today or this year, but you could 
take a bunch of things and start doing them. And it's going to take way more than writing a check. I have worked at a lot of places where they're like, can't we just buy another tool? Yeah, you can. You can buy as many tools as you want, but it might not make your apps more secure. And so we can't just check boxes. Um, we need real change. And I want the people in this room to be a part of that change. I want the people in this room to ideally, whether it be you actually start asking people for feedback, or you, you start the Security Champions program that you always wanted to do, or you talk, okay, so you know how we release the apps into the wild and then like we never look at them again? Like, What if we checked in on those? What if we ran a scan every month? What if we did or this, that? So I want the people in this room to be part of this change and just pick one thing and try to do it. And so I'm going to try not to be too awkward, but I want you... So, like, Jessica, you were so good yesterday when you did this. Like, she's like, close your eyes, and I'm, like, going on a journey with her. I want you to literally think about the things you learned today or this whole yesterday and today until the end of the day and try to do one because that will be one new thing you weren't doing before. And I, I feel like I can talk on behalf of some of the OWASP projects and chapter leaders. We're very, very passionate about AppSec. That's why they volunteer for free. If you are qualified to be a chapter leader or project leader, you could be making tons of money instead of volunteering for free for OWASP. We do it because we love our industry and we really want the world to have more secure software. So I want all of you to be part of this change with us and with OWASP. I know, I'm like OWASP's biggest fan. And so now I have some resources for you. And so the most obvious resource is the Open Web Application Security Project. And I want to encourage all of you to become members. I want to encourage you to join your local chapter and check out the cool work the projects do. But on top of that, this is the PDF summary. And so um, I'm putting it on here, but it's also going to be on the last slide. So if you want to just download a PDF that tells you all the things I said, I feel like it's handy to not have to take notes. Basically, I used to take notes all the time, and then they'd end up in the bottom of my bag, and then eventually whatever. But if I could download the slides or the notes, that really helps for me. And this will be again on the last slide. Um, I have an open source... or. No, I have a free online community called We Hack Purple. We have training courses. We have really cool live streams. Last month, Matt gave us this big demo of Defect Dojo and told us all the super cool stuff that you could do with it. And all of it's free. Um, I'm really good at AppSec, not so much business. Um, awesome books. I love DevOps, so I'm always going to recommend cool DevOps books. And so the first four books are all my favorite DevOps books. And then the last book is the one I wrote, Alice and Bob. And, um, you know, me and my mom agree, it's the best book ever written. Um, <laughs> I have a podcast, and it's creatively named the We Hack Purple Podcast, and I have lots of people on to just talk about AppSec and like trends or things or issues, projects, stuff they're working on. I've had a lot of OWASPers on there, like Sharif Mansour came on last year, and he talked about all the things he accomplished as a board member, which I thought was really awesome. Um, and then the last resource on this list is me. Um, I do stuff like this all the time because I'm really passionate about it. And so uh, if you want more, there is a lot more from me. And with that, I want to thank everyone for their time and attention today. And thank you for being a part of this. So are there any questions? And as a reminder, there is bribery, I mean candy, if you ask a question. There. People are fast. I know you got to move. I brought a big bag for a reason. How do, thanks. How do you measure the, how do you measure a security champion program? What are your KPIs? Oh, okay. So I have a blog post about this. Um, so to manage the program, I try to figure out what I can, how to scale it first, right? So if you have like 30 teams, you need to have more than one person working on that or it's their full-time job, right? So first I'm like, how many people can I handle? How many teams can I do? Do we have enough people for that? Then I'm lucky because I have a zillion presentations now and I have a zillion friends that give presentations. And so I invite like everyone I know to present to my team. Um, I actually ran a program as a dev for a very long time, and I called it the Lunch and Learn program, but basically I just invited all my cool friends to come in and teach us something new about software development. Then I met hackers, 
and AppSec people. And then eventually, I just kept having security things. And then they're like, you should probably organize these for OWASP instead. And so I try to make sure that I have capacity to start for managing it. And then for KPIs, I start with how many people are attending, how many people are asking questions, how many people cancel with me. So like each month, I want to meet one-on-one -on -one with each champion and ask them what's going on. If they cancel, it's like, cool, do you have time next week? No. Do you have time the next week? No. Okay, what's going on? <laughs> right? Because usually people have some time. And sometimes it's just they're very stressed or they have personal stuff happening. But if people aren't showing up anymore, it's like, do I need to swap out that champion, get someone else? I also, sh um, so like engagement, do they ask questions outside of those events? Do they tell me stuff that's going on? I try to keep a list of stories, and that might sound odd, but you can give as many metrics as you want to upper management. But if you say, this security champion informed me that this other team wrote their own crypto, which totally happened to me. They are base64 encoding it twice. Well, then that's different. No, it's not. Um, and so then before they released it, we were able to get in there and change it and fix it. Um, and I'm like, without him, who knows what could have happened? And so if you can keep stories like that, and I'm like, this is one of the values of our security champions. We just potentially avoided a, an extremely serious breach of data because of this. And so it might sound weird. I don't usually have like a KPI. It's more like here, like the program's growing, the program's steady, or the program's dying, and why? And then stories of specifically things that helped our organization. I don't know if that's what the answer you were looking for, but okay, thank you. Are there more questions? Over there. You're going to have to like jog. Oh, no. I know. You can start asking the question now, and I'll repeat it so people can hear you. <laughs> uh, thank you for your, your talk. This is really good, really nice. And we sh uh, when you're trying to find these this security champions, uh, which skills do you have more value uh, or, or which do you see in these guys to be your security champions in one way or another? That's such an awesome question. Okay, so um, I try to attract them to me, if that makes sense. And so I'll start with like, oh, I'm going to do a lunch and learn about this. Like, who wants to come? And I know this sounds bad, but I always try to bribe them with food. I'm very easily bribed with food. I'm like, oh, well, pizza, let's go. Um, so I try to get them to come to the presentations. And then whoever asks questions, I'm like, hey, did you know I'm looking for security champions? I think you might be awesome. And so I, I actually send invitations. And then um, I came up with this idea, and I didn't know if it would work, and my friend and I did it, or my colleague and I, but I don't know, he's my friend too. Anyway, and so we changed this, the end of our email, to, so you know, like, you'll have, like, your title, and you, like, you're like, look, I'm cool, here's my title, and here's, like, a website address or whatever. We changed it to, I'm looking for security champions, is that you? Ask me how. And so four people emailed us, and two of them became champions. And so it sounds like I, like I advertise. And so if there's an all staff or like we had like this big dev meeting every two weeks where all the devs would come and I'd be like right at the end, I'm like, hi, so I'm looking for security champions and, and people would be like, oh, well, I don't know enough to be one. Oh, no, I'm going to show you. And so it sounds weird, but like when I started my first champions program, I didn't even know I was doing it. I wanted all the devs to, to scan their apps with a really cool tool that OWASP makes. Um, and I, I was like, here's the tool, here's how you use it, here's all the things. But then very quickly, every team had that one person, and they were the person that, that would run the tool and do the tests. And so very quickly, I'm like, Liam, Stefan, like I had this, all the people, and I'd be like, you know, let's just have a meeting us and ask me how it's going, because they became the person. So one of them became the secure coding librarian, and he had all these cool samples of things we'd already tested. And one of them now works full-time AppSec, which is awesome. And so they sort of self-identified, if that makes sense. And so I try to give them the opportunity to self-identify, and I give invitations. Because a lot of people, we we heard this in a talk yesterday, some people have imposter syndrome where they're like, oh, no, I'm not smart enough to do that. I'm like, if you're a software developer, you're totally smart enough. You wouldn't be able to be a dev if you weren't smart. So I already know you can do it. And sometimes they just need that like gentle nudge and like support and assurance that they can do the thing. Does that help? Yeah. Thank you. All right, we're, we're at the hour. Yep. Um, I'm, I know Tanya. She will hang around and answer yep. questions. Yeah. 
I'm going to um, be over but here. But if you don't want to ask her a question or want to get coffee, there is coffee in the yeah. break. And I will get still coffee. hand out candy if you come up and ask a question. Yeah, yeah, I'll, we'll be right there. Let's, let's give a big round of applause oh, for Tanya. You. Thank you.